Amazing. So, hello everyone. Hello people in the audience. Thank you very much for joining um, and for being here tonight. We'll keep letting people in now and then when more people will be in the waiting room, but we will nonetheless start now with this um, All-Star Feminist Foreign Policy Panel that we have gathered for this evening's evening in Berlin um, session um, as part of our um, yeah, season of the Feminist Foreign Policy Summit. Um, I am Christina, I'm one of the co-founders of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. Um, we are a research advocacy community building organization that tries to bring in feminist perspectives in all fields of foreign and security policy. And um, we've been around here in Berlin for almost four years. And this April, in a month time, we will host the first um, Feminist Foreign Policy Summit in collaboration with a couple of governments that officially have a feminist foreign policy, but mainly in co collaboration and partnership um, with um, civil society partners from around the world. Um, and most importantly, with the most incredible speakers. And the event today is part of kind of the, the, the pre-season of the Feminist Foreign Policy Summit. We have, <laughs> we had so much interest and so many um, requests for partnerships and ideas. And um, when, with regards to the summit that we just had to extend it. Um, which is why we're having this event also tonight um, and more to come until the 4th, 13th of April and then the actual summit here in Berlin hybrid event though. Um, this evening, we're talking about making foreign policy feminist hopes and demands by a feminist civil society. So what we're really trying to understand is whereas over the past couple of years, we have seen more and more governments officially adopting a feminist foreign policy. It started with Sweden in 2014, then Canada and Mexico, Spain, France, Libya. Um, I forgot one because there was only six, but seven in total, um, Luxembourg um, and other countries like my country, Germany, who put feminist foreign policy in the coalition agreement last November. And so there's this like, trend or small whatever movement within governments to adopt feminist foreign policies. But really the, the truth is that feminist foreign policy comes from feminist civil society and feminist civil society has clear ideas about what feminist foreign policy should be like and has been warning of the danger of co-option um, when it comes to bringing feminist ideas into the Security Council as part of women, peace and security or to governments. So this is what we'll be talking about tonight. And I am so pleased to have the most um, incredible speakers here with me tonight. And I'll try to shut up as much as possible over the course of the next hour. Um, so with me, with us tonight, um, we have, um, I'm just opening my list here to not forget where actually everyone is based. Um, so we have Madeleine Rees. Madeline, if you would, wouldn't mind waving, um, Madeline Rees, the Secretary General of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. That's the oldest feminist organization working on um, militarism, peace and security. Um, she's based in New York. Thank you, Madeline, for being here. Then we have Gita Misra. Gita is the co-founder and executive director of CREA, a feminist organization, feminist grassroots organization based um, in India. And um, Gita tonight is in, in Delhi, in India. Um, then Memory Kachamba, executive director of the Africans Women's Development and Communication Network, Femnet. Memory is tonight, uh, today, this afternoon, this evening, um, based in Nairobi in Kenya. Thank you, Memory, for being here. Um, and also Helen Casey Noah, Executive Director at the Women's International Peace Center based in um, Abuja in Nigeria. Thank you for being here also. And last but not least, Beatrice Finn, um, Director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons based in Geneva. Thank you, ladies, for being here. So what I would like now, I would 
So we're going we're going to do like ping pong and like react to each other um, with like different sets of questions. Um, when each of you will speak kind of for the first time, um, if you could like give us the audience like one two sentences of what exactly you and your organizations are doing in, in, in where you are based or and how you work before you respond, respond to the wider question. So I would actually like to start with Gita. Um, and Gita, I'm hoping you'll stay through the whole um, um, session, despite some power outtakes that might happen. We'll see how this goes. Um, so Gita, we met two and a half years ago in, in Italy. Um, you are leading one of the most vocal feminist organizations in, in India. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the progress of a feminist approach to foreign security policy in India, because there have been more and more articles coming out of India in the past couple of months. Yeah, I, I, I will just take very little time to say that more of us who are working feminist civil society organizations are, are, are called to our governments is to for some action around feminist foreign policy, we want our state to commit to working together with us to bring a vision of you know, feminist foreign policy to fruition. And by that, we mean incorporating principles of justice, peace, and, you know, and uh, the domestic law and the you know, making more connections between domestic and international. I think what's happening in India right now is that the, the you know, words are being replaced and used interchangeably. Feminism, empowerment, women's rights, women's security. And very often some of these, they don't mean, they're more protectionist approaches towards women rather than protecting the rights of women. So, and, and I think we need more um, clarity. We're pushing for more clarity about what feminist values and principles mean vis-a-vis -vis connections with any foreign policy. And I think that is, uh, especially in the realm of policy and law, we don't want the state to perform progressiveness outwardly which very often they tend to do, while continuing to persecute, you know, people who we are referring to now much more as structurally excluded. Could be sex workers, it could be uh, working class people in our countries, it could be queer, trans people, and also um, making sure that the international piece of what they do. Uh, that might look progressive is not used to cover up uh, domestic policy that is that's happening. So I think our work is much more in terms of creating the conditions, the environment, and pushing policymakers to be accountable to feminist values, and then see how they get applied to whatever they do in the in the domain of policy and law making or in terms of what they sign on to in the international spaces that they often occupy. I hope that's helpful. Very helpful. Thank you, Gita. Can you briefly say two sentences about what CREA is exactly doing, what you're doing on a daily basis? So CREA is a feminist human rights organization. Uh, we work a lot on uh, feminist leadership uh, sexual reproductive health and rights, gender-based violence, and really working a lot more on uh, peace, democracy, civic, civic resilience, uh, and that. And within that, a big constituency of people we work with are people that we now do not refer to as marginalized or marginal, but much more as structurally excluded people. So that's what Kriya does. Thank you, Gita. Helen, um, I want to get you in. So you are leading the Women's International Peace Center. Um, and so what people very often don't know when we talk about feminist foreign policy 
and feminist international efforts uh, or feminist efforts on the international level that for example in the 70s when there was like the uh, international decade for women by the un um and kind of the work being done um oh are we frozen helen oh i think i just lost her right okay okay cool then doo -doo -doo. let me when we're waiting for helen to be back um but but may, maybe actually um memory yeah, you. oh helen you're here yes i'm, I'm here can you hear me uh, ah you now yes can hear you now yeah perfect um helen that kind of during the decade um, of the women by the UN in the, in the 70s, 75 to 85, and kind of all the preparation work was that it, it was a lot kind of so-called so South-South connections um, between feminists um, in colonies and, and feminists in, in the socialist states that drove the agenda back then. So kind of the um, big part of the rich history of feminist activism in international politics that 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 also comes from the African continent, what so many people um, neglect or, or do not um, 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 uh, not appreciate, but um, yeah, kind of neglect. Um, can I first? I like to um, I like you to under, give us a bit of an idea what exactly you're doing. You're also researching and involved in kind of women's involvement in different peace efforts, for example, in South Sudan and so forth. So uh, please give us a brief overview and then your opinion on the importance of feminist values in, in, in peace efforts and also how holding states accountable for, um, for war crimes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, I'm Helen uh, Kezianwaha, as already introduced, and um, um, I work for the Women's International Peace Center uh, based in Kampala, but I'm actually speaking from Abuja uh, in Nigeria. So the Women's International Peace Center uh, specifically works to promote women's participation in peace building. Uh, so we build uh, the leadership capacities of women, you know, for them to be more active um, in promoting uh, women's rights within peace building processes and post-conflict reconstruction. Our work is basically mostly in East Africa, um, like you've already mentioned, South Sudan, um, Uganda, um, DRC, Burundi. Um, we also do a bit of work in Nepal in Asia. Um, we recently also began to interrogate uh, feminist peace and what this means for the work that we do. Um, like said we in implementation of women peace and security agenda you know across many of the African countries to be able to give us a sense on uh, uh, what is being done in terms of the, the question you asked on how we can strengthen accountability on, on feminist uh, uh, foreign feminist foreign policies um, I would just like to say from the beginning uh, you know from the onset that the idea of feminist foreign policy looks very attractive, you know, um, but I just want to want us not to be very quick to not interrogate deeply um, what the feminist transformative values of these feminist uh, foreign policies are, uh, uh, you know, within us. And I really like the fact that, you know, we're beginning to ask ourselves the questions around how do we ensure accountability you know, for these uh, feminist uh, policies. I think first, it would be very important for us as civil society to develop a global, uh, regional and national objectives um, of what we want to see within these policies. Uh, and these objectives will then help us to develop the monitoring framework, you know, um, and indicators that we need to monitor. 
Um, generally, people are talking about feminist foreign policies, ensuring equal participation of women in decision making. And we know from, uh, from the history of you know, uh, women's participation in decision making that um, a woman uh, being at the table does not necessarily translate into them representing you know, women's issues and does not automatically mean that a woman who is at the table is feminist or have feminist values. Um, so we shouldn't um, be so quick to um, run into the same um, challenge we've had with women's participation to think that we just need the numbers. I think we should think through uh, not just the number of women in foreign policies, but what do these women bring um, to the table? Um, and I think the other thing we could do as civil society is to establish some kind of um, working groups of feminist leaders um, at, at regional, global, and country levels um, who can then meet with these feminist policymakers at country level, you know, to develop a form of mechanism for, for accountability because this is still new to us and we need to have that interface uh, with these leaders to have a common understanding first of what we mean and what is required. And I think it's very important that even when we promote this uh, feminist foreign policies that we need to find out from women um, and not just women and we shouldn't fall into the co-option of thinking that women are a homogeneous group that uh, we need to take into account the intersectionality among women to be able to bring different women to the table to find out from them what their expectations are of feminist foreign policies so that we don't go back doing, you know, having the same practice um, that, that we usually have. And I think I would just end by saying it's, it should also be very important that we demand for, for, for periodic briefings um, from, from countries uh, that have put in place feminist foreign policies uh, to report to us on what they have done specifically, and not just in terms of numbers, but transformative actions that have changed the lives of different categories of women in different situations. And to also recognize that women live in different situations uh, and their situations are different based on the countries where they live. Um, I will stop there, you know, so mm -hmm. that other people can speak. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. And um, what you mentioned about kind of bringing those feminist ideas and demands to policymakers um, um, and, and memory, I wanna, um, and bring you in now because most or all of those countries that officially have a feminist foreign policy they focus a lot on fem feminist ideas not really more, more like women's rights in in um, the international assistance so-called development policies and and you memory you are not only a, kind of a feminist thought leader but you're like a development expert right and you've been for a long time i would like to hear from you as we are speaking about demands from feminist civil society, but also the danger of co-option and, um, and those kind of still have a feminist foreign policy focusing like so much on international assistance development. Um, in, in where's the line? When is it more detrimental and, um, and, and cements like neo-colonial um, structures or when is it actually feminist and helpful those policies by Sweden and Canada when it comes to countries from the so-called global south? Um, thank you so much, uh, Kristen, and I'm so excited to be here on this platform. Uh, so what I can say is, I think what is important is to know that we've seen a lot of feminist leaders uh, emerging, feminist foreign policy, but we find that on one hand, whilst they are pushing for a feminist uh, policy, which is really good, sometimes it's more... Uh, at the back end, we also find that they're also not meeting their commitments uh, to development aid, for example. Commitments, uh, we are talking about climate change in the CSW 66, but also commitments uh, to adaptation, to, you know, the commitments are not coming, yet we do see that. And we also find that sometimes, um, whilst we have feminist foreign policy uh, governments which are leading, we also find when it comes to issues around militarism, which we'll talk about more, um, they are also supplying guns, they are also supplying weapons. We also find also when it comes to issues around extractives, around mining, um, you know, all the false solutions around um, having carbon sinks, 
is being driven by an agenda which is still colonial in its sense and which really has the powers and we, we saw it. I mean, we saw it with the whole COVID, how all of a sudden the feminist policies, values and principles do not actually function when it comes to a crisis. Because when you talk of feminist um, uh, policies, it should, be, it should be continual at all aspects and in all situations. So I think that accountability model, uh, we don't really see it. So sometimes it's, um, we, we still need a lot in terms of really addressing that um, structural. So most of it may be more, more superficial, but when it also comes to certain issues, particularly those that affect the global South, those that are also affecting um, us or on the continent, when you look at um, illicit financial flows, for example, um, the issues around um, uh, taxation, um, huge corporates, you know, the uh, trade, trade agreements, intellectual property. So I think uh, foreign policy, feminist foreign policy, what the beauty is, it questions that. I mean, it goes beyond. I think this is the, 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 the feminist scholarship has provided the tools to really question the power structures, to question the systemic and the structural. Look at issues on gender-based violence. Before the pandemic, we were so clear that it is a crisis, but it did not have the attention. The issues of care work, they were very, you know, we were talking about how women's work is invisible, it's not recognized, our contribution to the economy, and it really was um, amplified and multiplied, the inequalities. So when I think when you really talk feminist policy, it's about really getting deep to say when, when governments are not committing, you know, they come out, they say we are feminist, um, but they are not committing, or we have government leaders who say we are feminists, um, but they are not committing uh, adequately to, say, sexual gender-based violence, for example, sexual reproductive health, for example. The systems are broken, you know, and it's become systemic because it's, it's within the system. It's happening cyclic every year, every year. The numbers are not coming down. And then it becomes structural because it's normalized, it's accepted as if it's the status quo and there's no radical shift. So I think feminist policy really is a very transformative agenda to start addressing some of those systemic um, uh, global subordination of women. And it should really be a precondition if we are ever going to talk about gender equality, about addressing the multiple, the intersecting inequalities on climate change, on the pandemic, and on the economic crisis. Thank you, Memory. And I have a follow-up question, and please, Helen and Gita, come in as well. So in Germany, for example, the, the new um, Minister for International Development, um, International Assistance, she is very vocal about wanting to develop a feminist international assistance policy. Um, what would you ex expect, not, not only the outcomes, but from the process, what she and her team should be doing if they actually mean it genuinely and not want to do pinkwashing? Um, how can the German development ministry um, manage this process from like, more traditional understanding of development policy to a truly feminist? What would the right processes, what would the next steps be? What are your demands towards the German Development Office Ministry? Helen, Gita, memory? I mean, I think I could just add, maybe the question is about collaboration, cooperation, or seeing you know, how like now many of the uh, on the ground feminist groups like us are taking a stronger internationalist approach um, in our politics and our demands. And I think um, building that into any kind of 
like development policy around assistance would be really amazing. I think feminists are mobilizing for climate justice and calling for fewer restrictions on migration. Indigenous feminists are, you know, asking for a halt uh, in terms of occupation and holding, you know, countries accountable, organizing against police brutality. Um, I think if we take an example, even around the COVID crisis in the global South, I think feminists across the world are demanding that first world states and corporations end vaccine apartheid and release us from, so there could be very specific things uh, around patent laws, trade agreements, yes. which allow you know, first world states and corporations to act quickly. But I think in the end, it's about sharing and shifting power. And if you can use development assistance to do that, and of course the tenets of it are, how do you uh, get feminists to be, to participate more? How do you really focus on where there's a crackdown on activism and a contraction of space for civil society actors? How can development assistance sometimes get linked to expanding that space? You know, and in, and so I think there are many ways to do it. Some of it is contextual, some of it is principle based. Um, and it's quite exciting that, that there is a poss you know, there is a possibility of contributing to whatever uh, outcomes this, this uh, policy might have. Thank you. And, and maybe like allow me a question or is a development ministry so much um, based on colonial, neo-colonial ideas that it can actually never be transformed and it will always be about charity and it should not even exist, but rather a proper foreign policy that has a wider security approach? Memory Helen, maybe? Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, memory, go ahead. <laughs> Go on, Helen. Um, so just to add on to what has been said, I think that um, for Germany, if they are developing, um, if they are in the process of um, developing a policy for um, assistance to development countries or development assistance and aid, I think it's important for them to look at how their foreign policies impact on uh, the daily lives of different categories of, of women. Um, uh, because many times, and you talk about security, um, militarized security, and I, I just um, begin to reflect on what is happening right now. Um, we, are, we are seeing the, the, the attack on Ukraine as a means of um, militarized security for some other people and the impact that this is having on you know the population the country the destruction of the country the women and the children you know and how this is affecting everyone globally in terms of oil prices and uh, the economy the prices and different things and how people are also using this as opportunity to um, take advantage of oil, you know, uh, stealing oil and the, you know, and the rest of it. And more disheartening is what happens after this and post-conflict reconstruction and all those that, you know, they need to think about, you know, what kind of aid uh, is being provided to who and for what. Um, how is this uh, uh, assistance being uh, used by countries? What are the feminist values that determine how these monies are spent? Uh, who is holding, who are accountable to how these resources are used? And how do we really monitor if this kind of feminine, this kind of aid actually has any feminist transformative value, you know, that we are all talking about that changes the lives of women or that gives protection uh, to women and, and children in those situations. So I think that is very important that such aid also challenges patriarchal uh, uh, systems and structures, you know, that continue to perpetuate inequalities and discrimination within these different institutions that memory talked about within the international uh, flow systems within, you know, 
um, the economic system, climate change, you know, and all those different uh, scope of um, areas that, you know, we're talking about, that we cannot just um, provide aid without guiding and giving guidelines on how this is going to be used. But also just to reemphasize that we have organized feminist movements uh, that they can also engage with, you know, within some of these countries where the aid is going to give some kind of guide and feedback on what is required, you know, that could actually challenge and support feminist um, uh, values and that can all actually uh, change and, and contribute to addressing gender inequalities, you know, to, to, to achieve that kind of um, equality that we are looking, at, uh, looking for. Memory. Uh, yes, uh, so I, I think I also agree. And uh, Amina Mama reminds us that the greatest threat to women and by extension humanity is the growth and acceptance of a misogynistic, authoritarian and violent culture of militarism. So I think when we bring it home, I think this is where we will really need to start uh, seeing that the whole colonial, patriarchal, hegemonic power is still around rushing for resources. So where we find their resources, we also find out that um, there's a lot of conflict. But behind this conflict, um, we know their powers, we know their power structures, their systems, which are financing and which are also um, making sure there's instability. And this is the story of our continent. We look at Mali, we look at the DRC Congo, we look at Ethiopia, we look at Mozambique, we look at the Sahel, but not only on the African continent, also in other regions. So I, I, I think um, the, 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 when we talk about feminist uh, policies, it should really be a policy that can start uh, disrupting and dismantling the whole ideology around power and resources, because we are now moving more into, um, you know, the whole aspirations even around the SDGs, which are people, planet, prosperity. Um, they are really meaningless if they are not underpinned by a feminist uh, backing because when we talk of the, those huge aspirations, yet we have not addressed the gender inequalities and some of the root causes. So, you know, it takes us back a lot. So there's a lot of talk uh, without the actual action, without the actual commitment um, into some of, uh, some of the, the resources. So I, I think we, we really need to challenge and say, um, the, the feminist policy principles and values are very rich, but should they be misappropriated? Should, should they be co-opted, like you say, um, into uh, you know, just being co-opted without being accountable holistically to the other elements? And I, I, I think all this really resonates around the power, the power struggles really. And I, I think um, when you look at what feminists have been really challenging is the whole issues around power. And I think what Jita said about how we need to work together collectively, I think that that's actually a way in terms of what we aspire to say, if we stick to the values within the feminist foreign policy, then we must be true to the values. You know, we must ensure that we are calling in the other elements that are contrary to the values um, that uh, underpin feminist foreign uh, policy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Memory. And so you you talked about militarism, and I want to stick to that theme now for a bit. And um, in the light of Putin's aggression towards the Ukraine for the past two and a half weeks, um, in person, Madeleine Rees and Beatrice Finn, but especially also the organization Sea Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and International Civil Society Act, um, International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, um, have been very outspoken um, and been doing a lot of work around narratives. So initially, when we planned the event, I wanted to talk about um, um, women's rights, feminism being co-opted for militarist reasons, for example, in the in, um, in the context of preventing violent extremism. 
um, um, or, or getting more women into the military and call that feminism and so forth. But what I want to talk about now actually is that what we're seeing now in the light of this massive violence and aggression that feminist ideas and principles are being turned around and being accused of not being effective enough so we don't need them anymore because we see um, this approach has not rescued the whole world but we're at a point where we're now and we see kind of this whole turning like insane narratives that are being cemented now when it comes to militarism. Um, Madeline Beatrice, you've been commenting on that over the past days and weeks a lot and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Um, yeah, thank you. Can I go first, B, or do you want to have a go? Go for it. Go for it. Okay, just to say, because, you know, Wilf is the oldest women's peace organization. We're over 107 years old. And in 1915, wanted to, to expose the root cause of the First World War, which was, of course, militarism as a way of thought, inequalities between people and between nations, and the arms trade. To name but three. And if you think, apply that doctrine now, we haven't moved very far. And of course, as you said, Christina, it's all feminist fault because we didn't do enough to stop them, did we? You know, but I want to pick up just something that Gita said, because I think this is absolutely important, is this continuum of what feminism should and can be representing. And if we had that, if we were able to capture that and actually do away with, and this is my dream, one day we will get rid of feminist foreign policy because we will not have foreign policies. We will have feminist policies without borders. And that's what we have to get towards. And that's the narrative we need to start thinking of creating now, because over the last two weeks since the, the aggression towards Ukraine, there has been this incredible outpouring of solidarity towards the Ukrainian people and also solidarity towards the Russian people who have been objecting and taking huge risks to try to stop the war within their own country, from their own perspectives in their own countries, which speaks of a common humanity, which has asserted itself in the context of this conflict, which I think is fundamentally important going forward to what we as feminists can be building on, because it, it builds on what came out of the pandemic in terms of communities of care, the valuing the sort of, uh, of, of principles that feminism relies on, of actual solidarity, of understanding the social and economic underpinnings of the violence which has been created. And if we can bottle that and use that to say, this is what we need to do people in order to avoid future conflicts, then we have a different narrative being created. And that is one whereby we look at the root causes, which is, look, if you just trace the sanctions back, the sanctions are showing us exactly which banks, which oil companies, which interests, which politicians, which political parties were so embedded with the Putin regime in installing and profiting from that regime that we can then say that's what we have to stop. That, is, that increases this inequalities between people massively. And then so tracing it back, we see that's one of the root causes it manifests in the militarization of the need to protect those, those systems, which is then where you end up in the sort of conflict we've got now, which is, is replicative of what happened in 1914. Massive armed alliances surrounding other countries and with a colonial mentality, and boom, off we go again, boys. Thank you very much. That's what we've got to stop. What's happening instead is you've got the militarists and the nationalists seizing the narrative and trying to get that common humanity to say, oh, we need more guns. Oh, we must spend more in Germany. We need 100 billion that we've got to weaponize. We're all going to join NATO. No, don't do that. Absolutely do not do that. That leads us exactly to where we are now. Let's stop. Let's look what caused this. Let's see what feminism has to teach the world in terms of being able to understand how better we can actually address toxic masculinities. Poor 16 year old kids getting dragged out of their houses now to be conscripted, not just in Russia. You know, they're, they, what, what are they doing there? There's, you know, the masculine ideal must be those who will resist being co-opted into going and fighting somebody else's families. It's those sorts of things which I actually think are in our instincts, in our primal instincts, that common humanity is a survival technique. And we are abused of that by those who promote militarism, who promote nation statehood, 
and who are absolutely, as has been mentioned by so many already, the misogyny of patriarchy is what drives it forward. And it benefits nobody, absolutely benefits nobody. And I know what Beard's going to say next. And I think that's going to take us right into how absolutely it doesn't benefit anybody. So we have to, I think, change the narrative, work towards the abolition of the nation state so we can all live as human beings and deal with the most important security issue that we face wherever we are, and that is the degradation or the ending of the planet as, a, as an inhabitable place for us all, not just people, but everything in it. Bea. Yeah, Madeline, um, couldn't agree more. And I thought that I think that it was uh, memory set, uh, you know, something that just really summarized it like the sort of the biggest threat is this militarized colonial patriarchal authorial sort of power structures uh, that we have. And I think that, you know, just, just seeing the, you know, Putin's action and the invasion of Ukraine, but also the responses to that is just such a prime example of that. And I, I know it's like, it's one of the difficult things but with working to change something is that the burden of proof is always on us. Mm. Uh, and I find it really, that's really frustrating. The people who got us into this mess never really have to answer like how they're going to solve it. Uh, they are not the ones who are having to answer these tough questions, but it's very easy for them to say, turn around right now under this sort of circumstance, like, ah, what, what are feminists going to do with Putin now? And, and how would you get him to stop with uh, feminist foreign policy? Completely ignoring the fact that decades of destruction of international law, of military spending, of unraveling these kind of arms control treaties, continued increasing of military spending, this obsession we have with masculinity, again, these male leaders, and, you know, media stories about who has the toughest handshake, you know, Biden or Putin, who shakes the toughest hands, right? Um, who has the toughest rhetoric towards the others? And somehow putting that on, on us, I mean, if there's a generally been feminist foreign policy in all of these countries right now for the last decade, I missed it, right? Like, I didn't, I didn't yeah. see that we were in power, were we? I don't think so. Um, so I just find, find it very, very frustrating that people who have been fighting our movements, our issues, the entire way will not give an inch, will not let us win a single fight, like without lots of blood, sweat and tears kind of thing, and turn around and say, why haven't you fixed it? Mm. And it's an incredibly unfair conversation that drives me sort of like furious sometimes. But at the same time, of course, that's the way it is, right? Like that's the way power works uh, in a way. And only the people who challenge power are the ones who get questions. The people in power, they're just there. They have status quo. They don't have to, they don't have to like, defend why they are there. And I find it also extremely... I mean, now we're seeing this kind of enormous, almost unity against Putin and Russia and, and that kind of thing. Like, and everyone is like gathering to kind of condemn it. Um, but you also have to watch and like who condemn it and is so much against it that they want to be him. Mm. And I find that also the kind of messages I receive sometimes from these um, people who think that I'm naive, that I'm stupid, that you know you don't understand anything and you should shut up and you should not do this kind of work and you are the enemy of our state. And you just kind of like, do, do you see the similarities here? So, and, and, and sometimes I answer, so do you want to shut down civil society? Do you want to shut down activists? Do you want to shut down human rights defender, women's rights defender and want them to be quiet and just listen to the great leader? and do like, is that because that seems an awful lot like the person you are angry with right now, Putin. Um, and I think that it's our job to really explore those kind of, um, and put a focus on that. Um, and also um, make sure that we do kind of take the, the, that we don't despair just because uh, we're getting accused of, uh, you know, being the problem when actually uh, we are the solution uh in that way um but i think it's 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 certainly feels in moments like you kind of thrown decades back in time right and the progress mm -hmm. that has been made and i think it ties about a little bit to what we talked about in the beginning this kind of co-opting feminist foreign policy 
And if it's so easy just to swoop it off, then maybe it wasn't genuinely feminist foreign policy that, that was being carried out, right? And if it's, if it's something that when a crisis happens, you just sort of go completely the different direction, um, that means that it wasn't a, a truly genuine kind of way of looking at the world and, and where we need to keep working. Absolutely. Peter, before I get you in in a second, you messaged that you have a comment and I want to hear that. Also, Memory and Helen, please also raise your hands if you want to comment on that. But I want to have a follow-up question for Beatrice and Madeleine. Um, Beatrice, you also work for Women's International League for Peace and Freedom before you started um, working for the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Madeleine, you are the, the big boss of WILF. Um, <laughs> and like you mentioned 1915, 1,200 feminists coming together in The Hague, like women like um, Jane Adams, Anita Augsburg, Lida Gustava Heyman, um, you name them all. They, they've been warning, they, been, they had been working against the militarization. They had been warning of the, sec the, the first world war, exactly how it happened, of the second world war. Um, do you feel for feminist history repeating itself? Or like, how do you feel about the current situation when it, with the historic, um, with the context in mind? Oh yeah, it's the simple answer to that. Oh yes, but worse. Because I mean, if you look at the inexorable process there's been, First World War, pretty horrible. Second World War, even more horrible because we've suddenly dis discovered nuclear weapons. This one, it's over. You know, basically it's the intensification of it all the time. So we actually do have, I think we have one of those seminal moments and Wilf was born out of conflict in order to end conflict. And we as feminists, all of us have got to now stand together to stop this. And I'm just going to say this, there's a an coming soon, spoiler alert. We all need to go to Sarajevo at the end of June. We're going to have a feminist women's summit. We want women from all over the world. We're going to get more than 1,200. It's bigger than Wilf. And we are going to redesign the post, the post third potential war structural relationship between countries, between the United Nations, between policies. So we end up with feminism. And that's what we're going to demand. And that's what we need. It's one of those times. It's that time now, as you say, it's gone from 1915. We keep getting one step forward, 15 steps back, because the structures which everyone has spoken to remain intact. And I wonder how much we can keep on trying to plant seeds into cement because we're not fungi, we can't quite crack it. So I do think we have to really have a fundamental reorientation of our way of thinking. And we wanna put that together in a feminist summit in Sarajevo, which will, I think, be the, the platform for what Wilf did in 1915, which was actually identifying those root causes and saying, this is what we have to do to make those changes. Let's do it again, regroup, re-strategize, change the narrative, bring people with us, and change the structures which will forever keep perpetuating the sorts of conflicts that we're seeing arise. And, and just, just to add on that, and that sounds amazing, Madeline, I want to go. Um, uh, and, You're coming. Maybe, <laughs> and just one of the really frustrating things is that so much of the work that we do is preventative. Um, and it's not something that is, um, and, and I think that that's like sort of like seeing the, the calls to action in 1915, seeing the warnings. Uh, and I, and it, it repeats not just on, on issues of war, but it repeats on all issues. I mean, mm -hmm. I've seen climate change scientists and NGOs and women activists who are sort of warning about the impact of climate change for decades. And yet decision makers didn't act and I've seen uh, experts and scientists and activists and NGOs warning about pandemics. It's going to be a pandemic, right? Like this, it's going to happen. Yet, you know, governments were completely like, oh, what just happened uh, when the pandemic hit? And then we see things like, of course, nuclear weapons that, you know, both Wilf uh, and I can have warned about for many, many decades and talked about this, like, see, uh, arms control agreements are being unraveled. International law is being undermined. Diplomacy is being stamped and trampled on. This is really bad science. We're seeing a new nuclear arms race. This is really bad science. Listen to us. But very often gets dismissed and ignored. Uh, yeah. And we've seen how civil society and particularly women's group are really, really good at flagging these issues in advance and saying, hey, bad things are happening here. And I remember Madeline at Wilf, you know, years before the Syrian war, there was like, you know, we should really stop selling weapons. 
to Assad, this would be a really good idea to like stop these kind of weapons in Afghanistan, for example. Don't think that just sending like lots of military there is going to fix things. Maybe, you know, supporting the women's rights movement there and democracy efforts and development things will be a better thing. Yet it gets completely dismissed from the people in power. Yeah. And yet when it happens, and you sort of like, um, we, we, we said this, like we warned about this, well, ah, don't dwell about the past. Now we have to look at the future. And let's ask the people who were wrong the entire time for what we should do now, yeah. instead of asking the people yeah. who actually warned about this the entire time. And I know that, for example, like now, just with this kind of flurry of tension around, around nuclear weapons, we still have difficulties, even though we've born about this for, for a decade now, we still have difficulties getting out in media, for example, and talking about this, because you know what they want? The generals to give analysis yeah. about this kind of war and how that works. They don't want to hear the people who actually warned about this and said, take this seriously now, like several years ago, because it's going to happen. And I think that's also like, we have to be better at valuing the preventative and valuing the, the kind of like, we have to do something before and it's very, I know it's hard as human nature to value something that was prevented because it didn't happen. So how do you know that it mattered what we did? But we have to figure out also as movements to really uplift that because I think that without that and without recognizing that the people who warned about this and said, don't do this, needs to be listened to next time. Yeah. Absolutely. And just warning you, I'm sorry, I will go five minutes over. Sorry to each of your time. Um, Gita, please come in and, and memory Helen afterwards as well. Yeah, I think I just wanted to add what when Madeline was talking, I mean, I love the idea of having feminist policies, but and you know, just to elaborate further that those would be about defeating the logics of war, occupation, mm -hmm. militarism, and colonialism. I mean, that's our work. And to which extractivism and exploitation are inherent. So feminist policies then become about replenishing the planet, our communities and our movements with trust, energy, and with power. I think that's the work, the intersectionality of you know, being able to do this work to, so that, and not that it should be that only in the feminist foreign policy space, we talk about uh, you know, we defeat the logic of war. You know, you have to kind of defeat that and the ideas around that, both, you know, within the domestic spaces as well as, so that's when you kind of, you know, there's this continuum. So I love what Madeline said, and I thought, you know, we should define then what would it be? You know, it would be about replenishing our planet and our movements as well as our communities. So that's what I wanted to add. Completely agree. I think that answers some of the questions in the chat as well, Gita, well done. Yeah, definitely. Memory, Helen. Yeah, um, I also just wanted to add something. I think um, uh, Beatrice has been speaking about how what we have been saying as feminists uh, is never taken. You know, when we actually um, actually know this is the solution and it's dismissed, it's not given its priority. And I know um, uh, on, on we, there was a campaign on the continent by the African Union uh, on silencing the guns. So this, this was launched um, and after like in 2020, it was up to 2020, so seven years. And then actually there wasn't much progress which had been done. And the Institute of Security Studies, uh, they did a monograph and they were saying one of the issues why the silencing the guns um, was really not able to fly is because it remains conceptually debated. And I, I, I think this is the same with um, our feminist foreign policy. I mean, with the silencing the guns, the institutional, the conceptual, the political, even the operation, there was actually a roadmap. Um, so the campaign was relaunched. So we are still wanting to silence the guns on the continent. And I think breaking that um, conceptual um, praxis is, is one thing that maybe um, within when you talk about feminist uh, policies, because we know this is, we know what works, but there's so much resistance 
even when we are not putting the weight foreign policy like what Madeline says. And I think that's where we should really be, be moving. I was also uh, looking at the, at the on, on the 13th of March, we, we sort of, we celebrated and honored Lillian Ngoi, who was a South African activist. So together um, with other activists, Sophia and Helen, they, they, they led a revolution in 1956 where you know, they were actually protesting against the, the apartheid uh, regime, which gave passes to women to work. So they, were, they chose a date like Thursday where all the domestic workers were there. And you know, when women actually lead revolutions, I think um, you know, the world, it's, it's, I, I think it's, there is evidence that we have really seen that women can stop wars, women can actually lead in terms of creating um, a peace agenda and mm. it's a feminist agenda. But then um, the, the fight and the struggle is so, is so contested. So I think until we have that conceptual agreement in terms of really saying feminist policies, it's a win for all. Most definitely is. Thank you, Memory. Um, Helen, before I'm getting you in, um, the rest, please think about kind of final remarks. If you have some you would like to give in a second after um, Helen spoke, um, and I, I guess I would appreciate something in those really dark, I guess, times, something hopeful. And um, Madeline, the, the, the conference that you mentioned, that would be an example, like something that we can hold on to. Um, I mean, feminist solutions are the solution to all to humanity. So even if it's only you elaborating on that a little bit, thank you, Helen. Yeah, I'm just going to be building on what uh, Beatrice and Memory were saying in terms of systems and structures that externally proclaim, you know, like in Africa, silence in the gun and globally feminist foreign policies, uh, but inwardly are really not practicing feminism in any way. And I think the most painful aspect of it is that the world has given um, the power to this or the responsibility to this super milit patriarchal <laughs> militarized masculine individual, you know, the, 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 the mandate to take on the security of the world. And I'm talking about the Security Council of the UN and, and look at the members of the Security Council and look at the debates at the Security Council. Um, and the fact that I think like Madeline was saying, it's time we take over these things, you know, create our own space, define our own agenda and allow them to come into the space and begin to ask us exactly what is it we are talking about. Because going into their own spaces, we are being co-opted. You know, how do we then avoid that? Is, you know, then doing what Madeline is saying, bring all the women together, create our own space, develop our own vision, our own feminist vision. And then we all work towards achieving that instead of allowing people to play politics with our lives, uh, with the lives of our children and yet the ones that are not yet born uh, and then um, it is going to take us to destroying the whole world and then what do we say to ourselves um when we had the opportunity to act so i think the time for action is now you know for feminists globally yeah thank you okay final round um ramos Beatriz, madeline guitar memory So, um, I think, I mean, I think it is, um, like Madeline mentioned earlier as well, like there's a massive outpour of solidarity with Ukrainians. Um, and in a way, and I think that that's also something to build on and to really, you know, there's a, an anti-war kind of sentiment that we haven't seen uh, for a long time. And I think that's also something that we really, really need to build on. I think there's also this opens up, um, and even though the criticism and the condemnation from, uh, of Russia can seem from some others that have committed similar crimes and bombed hospitals and invaded countries in the past can seem um, hypocritical. I think it's really important that we then, okay, let's hold you to this, right? And let's hold you to these kind of standards. And if you think what Russia is doing is so bad, 
let's make sure they can't do it again. And I'm thinking, for example, the the whole idea of the Security Council, which is so inherently problematic uh, with these five countries with the permanent seats. And the fact that countries left the Security Council, took the issue of Ukraine out of the Security Council, went to the General Assembly, and even a country like the United States said, well, it's blocked here. And I think that same thing with nuclear weapons. A lot of countries are criticizing Russia's nuclear threats, even though they are prepared to do the same thing. Um, and I think that there, it gives us also opportunities, right, to kind of pick off a piece. And like, if, if, if Russia can't be a legitimate member of the Security Council, we can't have, you know, because look at them, they're using their veto, like you can't do that, then the whole system crumbles. And I think that the same thing with nuclear weapons right now, if whatever happens, and if we survive this and all those kind of caveats, of course, um, but we can't go back to a Russia that is a legitimate nuclear weapon state, right? That sits in the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and just like, well, we are one of the five, we keep peace and stability with our weapons. I mean, it's it's gone. That illusion uh, that was always wrong, of course, but it's completely gone. So I think that there is a moment now to also, Russia has been able to crush some of these kind of silent complicity like between these countries. Uh, and we can kind of push our messages in there and kind of like pry it open and break it completely because those structures were never useful from the beginning. They were never good from the beginning. So. I will not let Russia come back to like, you know, whatever happens with this war, they can't just come back as a nuclear weapon state and just be like, this is a legitimate thing. We're one of the P5 and we have nuclear weapons. No. And when they go, like when they can't have that anymore, nobody can have it because then the whole system, the US needs Russia to be nuclear armed in order to keep its nuclear weapons and China needs both of them in order to. So I do think even though it feels extremely hopeless, I think that there are moments and like little opportunities and we can't fix all of it. And I think it can feel very overwhelmed right now. And I feel really it's heavy, right? And to defend all of these different things going on. And maybe we just also focus on one or two things and kind of stay mentally sane by focusing on, I can make some progress here. The big picture, maybe I need to like, not think so much on it because I think that it's, we have to remember that this is a long fight uh, and we have to stay sane individually as well. We definitely have to. Madeline, memory, Gita, one minute each. Is that okay? Gita, no? Cool. I, okay, um, I can jump in because I think that everything that's been said here will contribute towards ending the sorts of systems and structures that we have been decrying really in our, in our feminist critique. Three things. One, we change the narrative, as we've all said. We've got to actually have a narrative which describes our common humanity and puts care at the core of all of that and brings our feminist principles into it. We have to have as a question of chat, how, how, chat about how would, how would feminism deal with Putin. It's about rule of law. It's about ensuring accountability through the act, through using legal regimes which actually recognize the importance of human rights and the importance of understanding gender within them so that we can actually be progressive in our understanding of how we protect each other and look after our own rights and everybody else's within it. And that's vital. And the third thing is, with all the discussions of the structures we know are wrong and the games that have been played in order to create those structures and to ensure their continuity, as, as Bea was just saying, through the use of the veto, the, the Security Council, that the, the way in which it's been, it's the charter started off with the right ideas and put the wrong structures in to make it happen. That's what we have to change. And I'm calling for everybody that possibly can to come to Sarajevo. It's not just a will thing, it's an activist thing, it's a feminist thing. We need to do this, people. Um, we need to actually make our voices really heard and to design from all the wonderful things we've heard today. We've, we've got brilliant people who know what to do. We know what to do. And I'm fed up, as Bia is, of the same people coming with the same solutions to the issues that they have created. We've got to do this. We've got to change it. We've got one shot because that window on the planetary survival is closing, as we have been told, or they get lost in the fogs of war. So that's what we need to do. And um, in the spirit of great optimism, I think we can do this. So let's at least try. We will. Memory, final words. Um, I think for me, it's uh, we need to, I think this is a time for us to reflect in terms of some of the international structures, whether they work for us, um, we saw it with COVID, what doesn't work should just be a new turning point uh, for the world. And it should be 
the feminists because I think what we are, what we are putting on the table is really something that um, is is something that it is the solution uh, to humanity, and I think we can't afford any to lose this moment and really um, echo what Madeline was saying. Make sure that our voices are not only heard, but that um, we are also part of the processes, because if we are not in those spaces, so we need to keep pushing to ensure that we are in those spaces where decisions and the turning point will be. We have to remain optimistic, but we know that it has to be the feminists who will lead the revolution. 100%. Thank you so, so much. Um, that was not enough time at all, um, but that is also why Sarajevo is happening, why we have our summit in a month of time, why prior to the summit we have a, a range of events happening. Anna, who's sitting next to me and also leading all the work around the summit, she shared the information, the program in, in, in the chat. Um, please join the other events. Um, thank you so much, Helen, Memory, Gita, Beatrice, Madeline. Um, I can say from the whole team at CFFP, it is our biggest honor and privilege to be able to be working alongside you visionaries and you know, feminist thought leaders. Um, it's been amazing. Um, sorry for stealing more of your time, um, but really appreciate it. And can't wait um, to build on this feminist revolution um, with you even more. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone listening in.